a whole lot in a nutshell of what I've got to talk about this morning. Love lifted me, and it, isn't it wonderful this morning that uh, we can come in? Doesn't matter how kind of what kind of attitude or mood we're in, but love can lift our spirits and can lift our uh, whole existence. Uh, and He did that day on Calvary. He brought His love and showed it in a great and wonderful way, uh, sacrificing Himself for us, and that we could be saved. What a wonderful morning to celebrate that. It's good to see you this morning. Good to see Preacher Hodges and his wife. And it's good to just be in the Lord's house. And uh, so I'm thinking about love lifted me, and I'm thinking about a new year. As John said in his prayer, uh, we are here on the very verge and the precipice of a, a new year. And uh, just thinking about this year past and what a blessing God's blessed us with and uh, many Many things uh, that uh, I can look and say, this came from the Lord, and, and all the good things come from Him. And there's many trials, there's many things that went on that we, we had to bear, but all in all, um, could have been a lot worse, could have been uh, lots of other things we had to deal with, and I'm sure if we had our spiritual eyes open, we can see or could see uh, many times when the Lord picked us up and, and shielded us or protected us and, and sent us on a different route. You know, sometimes I think about when you get on the road and there's somebody slow in front of you and you get aggravated and you get angry and you get thinking about it, but then you get on up the road somewhere and there's a bad wreck and you think about, well, if I hadn't been slowed down by that car, I'd been right in the middle of this. And uh, he knows, and not to say that, uh, you know, that person didn't have the Lord looking after them that was, was in the wreck, but anyway... In John chapter 15 and verse 1, talking about the vine this morning and thinking about being grafted in. And he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. And I, I thought about, first of all, how truly blessed and miraculous it is that he counts us and chooses us to be grafted in to the vine. I thought about how bad it looks and how how wrong it probably is, and I imagine maybe a Maserati or some kind of sports car or, or expensive car, and you go up and you look and there's some, some rotten bananas laid on the dash, or maybe there's a trash bag on the side, uh, passenger side, or, or trash all the way through it, and somebody says, get in, get in, and you have to kick trash out of the way uh, to get in the car, and that would just look bad, wouldn't it? And I thought about our divine Savior, and I thought about Almighty Holy God that would choose us as low and as, as, as dishonorable and as rotten as I am. And he chose to graft me into the vine. And he said, you're clean through the word, verse 3, which I have spoken unto you. And I thought about how precious that is. And I, I thought about how many times during the year I thought, you know, we, we get this feeling that, well, I'm going to go to church and pretend to be okay. Or I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do just out of a feeling of duty. Or I'm going to, you know, do my best uh, just because that's what my, my mom and dad expected of me. Or, or on and on we could go with reasons we have for going on. But uh, the major main reason is that he's cleaned us and he's made us part of the vine. And I, I can't help but get away from the thought that how blessed and, and just precious that is. That he's engrafted us. And he's taken us and, and adopted us as children. Loved us. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. He said, abide in me and I in you. And if there's a, any formula that I can think of for this coming year to be happy, to be healthy, to be growing, to be uh, what we should be, is to stay in him. Abide in him. 
Abide in me and I knew as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. That's something I need to keep on my mind at all times. I can't do it on my own. And I try. I try so many times. I, I think I'm going to just get up there and, and do, you know, and go and do. And, and it always, unless I'm in him, unless I'm praying, unless I'm reading his word, unless I'm uh, letting him lead, I'm falling on my face. Branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No man can ye, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast him into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and in my words, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be by disciples. So what we're asking for and what we're praying for is, should be and will be something that glorifies the Father. And the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things have I spoken unto you that by my joy, that my joy might be, remain in you and that your joy might be full. If we're looking for a good new year and a good uh, coming year and we're, we're thinking about what's going to make it special and what, what we should do or what we can do, here's the formula. Abide in him. Trust his love, trust his word, trust uh, his grace for our lives. Don't do anything without some prayer and some thought to what would Jesus do and what, what would he have me to do and where do I need to go to bring him glory, to, bring, to be fruitful, and to give him the honor and the glory that he deserves. I thought about being part of that vine. How it is when you pluck the whole vine, the, the vine off of the branch, or the branch off of the vine whenever you're pulling fruit, uh, there's no, no more hope for fruit off of that branch, is there? So anytime we're feeling disconnected, anytime we're feeling like we're out here outside of the will of God and we, we feel that condemnation or that coldness or that feeling of, I'm just messed up or whatever. The Lord sometimes takes us to the woodshed. I'm thankful there's second chances. I'm thankful that he's blessed us with. Uh, he said I, he's faithful and just to forgive us if we go to him in prayer and go to him and, and confess our sins. That my, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I'd like to have some joy this year, wouldn't you? I'd like to abide in him. I'd like to get in his word and have it a part of me so much so that uh, everything I do and everything I look at would remind me of him and then remind me of what his word says. And, and in that love, uh, they're, they're connected, the word and the love. How that we can see, you looking out, everything that comes along, the Lord sent it. The good thing. We can see his love. We can see him working things. I love to watch God working in people's lives, don't you? Especially when you've been praying for that and you've been looking for that and the Lord begins to move and he begins to work and they begin to uh, realize what it's all about. What a blessing. What a blessing. So for joy, for a purpose, for something to work for, something to live for, Abide in him. Read his word. Abide in his love. Do his commandments. I think we'll find that joy. The title of our lesson is The Righteousness of God's Name. You know, we all know as Christians that Jesus is righteous. And we also can be righteous when we walk with him. But the world, the world sees someone being righteous 
they see someone being righteous in, in, in a different way. Righteousness is what they see in their own eyes. Someone that's living a, a good life, don't get into trouble, maybe even go to church some, give to charities, and overall is just a, a good person all around. The world sees them as a great member of society and would call them being righteous. And people also think of themselves being that way. This is being called self-righteous. A lot of people, they give this time of year, which is a good thing. But what's their motive? So others can see them give, how much they give, maybe kind of grow their status with other people. Or maybe they give so they, they can count it against their taxes. <laughs> Tax season, yeah, it's just around the corner. But whatever the reason is, they might be able to fool other people, their peers, and, but they cannot fool God. God knows their heart. He knows, you know, why they're giving. And it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with making themselves righteous. So here's the truth. To the God's standards of righteousness... It is impossible for anyone to achieve righteousness on their own. It's impossible. But God, he made it possible for us to be made righteous through Jesus Christ. You know, thank God. Thank God for sending his only begotten son, his son Jesus, for us. Which is the only reason that we should be celebrating Christmas. You know, government and, and econ, you know, the common, economists, they love Christmas to try to help our economy, which is actually, if you really think about it, is the reason they haven't tried to do away with Christmas. Santa Claus, oh, he's a lot of fun. You know, it's a wonderful thing seeing kids open up their gifts on Christmas morning. Seeing their smiles, smile on their faces. And I'm sure, I'm sure God loves seeing smiling children. But Santa Claus is not the reason we celebrate Christmas. Christmas time, we worship and praise God for sending his son. Everything else we do at Christmas is fine. As long as we remember and acknowledge the real reason. I guess I need to get to our lesson, don't I? The first part of our lesson is taken from Jeremiah, and the last, the last two sections are, are from Romans. In Jeremiah, the prophet, he preaches to, Ju Ju to Judea and other nations, telling them, hey, better days are coming. What Jeremiah doing, was also doing is he was calling out the sins of the leadership of Judea. They were crooked and they were disobedient to the Lord. In verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll rise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and the justice in the earth. In the days to come, Jeremiah, he was introducing the news of the coming Messiah. And he is saying this message, it comes from the Lord. You know, after uh, Judea fa had fell to the Babylonians in uh, 586 B.C., what it really appeared, it appeared that King David's line of ruling over Judea was over. But Jeremiah said, nope, there's hope. He said that God would raise a Messiah that he would bring to his people hope. God would raise a new king from the line of David. And his kingdom, it would last forever. 
He shall reign and, and prosper, which is mean that, that the coming king, he would rule wisely and would have insight of the ways of the Lord. The coming king, he would bring justice and judgment. You know, back in Jeremiah's days, the kings, the priests, the prophets, they were faithless. They were corrupt. And there was no justice, especially for the common folks. Many false prophets, they're just telling lies. You know, this week I saw on TV a false prophet being interviewed. He was dressed in, in white, white robe, and his appearance looked good. I mean, he looked good. But there was absolutely nothing, nothing he said that was right. He said Jesus was a Palestinian, not a Jew. He said he was a fugitive because the land was occupied. You know, you hear this all the time on the news. The land was occupied, and that was the reason he fled to Egypt. He said a lot more other crazy stuff, but everything that came out of his mouth was a lie. But he spoke with authority, and I'm sure many people believed him. Satan, he is a liar, and he can make things sound so right. <laughs> me watching it, actually, it made me mad when I heard this false prophet uh, talking. But Jesus, hey, soon, he's going to set this false prophet straight. As, Mer as Jeremiah said, better days are coming. He was right. Jeremiah was right. God sent us a Messiah. In verse 6, In his days Jesus shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. So better days came because the Messiah, Jesus, came to save us from our sins. We can be righteous through him. As Jeremiah said, the Lord, our righteousness. As a child of God, we can say today, yes, better days are to come. FC, <laughs> he's experiencing those better days right now. You know, we all that are a child of God, we will experience those better days by spending eternity with our Lord and Savior. What a day that will be. Our next section is taken from Romans. And it addresses people that, have not, that has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Paul wrote the letter to, to the Romans. Now, at this time, Paul, he had not been to Rome yet. So this letter was more of an introduction and summary of the gospel that he was going to preach when he got there. He was telling them both that the Jews and the Gentiles are under sin. The Jews, they had no advantage over the, over the Gentiles when it came to their relationship with God. Now, the Jews had not heard something like this before. They always felt like they were the only ones that could have a relationship with God. But Paul tells them that both the Jew and the Gentile, they deserve judgment for their sins. But there's also, there's good news for both. Through Jesus Christ, both the Jew and the Gentiles can receive salvation by putting their faith in Jesus. And you're going to hear this theme a lot in this last part of this lesson, faith in Jesus. Verses 11 and 12. There is none righteous, 
No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So Paul here, he makes it pretty clear. There is no one that is righteous. No one has ever kept God's law perfectly. Because of our sinful nature, <laughs> it's impossible, impossible to do. But the world, they don't understand this. People today in the world is probably, if you think about it, they're more intelligent than we've ever been before. More people have gone to college which in my opinion doesn't mean much anymore after a while they're being taught. That's my opinion. But overall, more people are educated. But here's another fact. People today are more ignorant of the ways of God. A lot, see, you know, a lot of people, they see the cross as being foolish and insignificant. They don't seek after God. Instead, they seek after man. Jesus, he seeks them. He knocks at the door. But they just ignore and do their own thing. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus tells us his mission. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is, was lost. Aren't we grateful, thankful that Jesus seeked us and saved us? In verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Paul says that people have gone out of the way. This is meaning that people, they're just ignoring, they're ignoring God. You know, when people ignore God, they become unprofitable. A person that does not have a relationship with Jesus, it's impossible for them to bear spiritual fruit that is acceptable to God. What does a person have to offer God? Think about this. What do they have to offer God? With sin in our life, we can offer God nothing spiritually. Now, people can give, which looks good, and maybe they can help other people with their giving. But what they're giving, God already owns it. That is the reason Paul says that none doeth good, no, not one. We have nothing to give to God. Have nothing to give for him to use or anything that is worth anything to God if you're lost. We have, you know, have, have you ever tried to give someone a Christmas present and they already have everything. And you're struggling trying to figure out what in the world can I buy them? God, he already has everything except one thing. A sinner that hasn't accepted Jesus. You know, this is the reason God sent his only son to die on the on, on the cross for our sins what a gift that God has given us the only thing the only thing a person can give back that is worth anything it's ourselves putting our faith in Jesus in verse 13 their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used the seat. The poison of apse is under their lips. 
You know, Paul compares a sinner's throat to an open grave. Their heart is buried in the seed of death. You know, their tongues speak lies and deception, just like the man that I saw on TV. You know, the tongue is a very small member when compared to the rest of the body. But what destruction the tongue can cause. It can defile the whole body. It can deceive others and take advantage of others. Their speech can be godless. And Paul compared it to a venom, venom of a snake that can kill. Most things that come from their lips, it's just a lie. You know, the church back then had many false prophets, just like we do today. All they do, they try to deceive people. You know, I couldn't help when I was studying this, couldn't help but think of all the people that use telephones today to try to deceive people out of their money, especially older people. You know, if you get a call from someone and you don't know who they are, and they start trying to get you to give them some information from you, they make it sound good. Remember Satan? He's good. Hang up the phone. Don't even talk to them. Their lying lips can be very deceitful. Okay, it's time to get away from this negative stuff. Let's start talking about some good news. In verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnesses by the law and the prophets. Through Jesus, God revealed his righteousness. Paul in this verse says, without the law. You know, through God's law, it instructed how to live and how to have a right relationship with God. The Jews, they had to use their own ability to try to keep this law. They had to try to live by the law and keep it, but they couldn't. So they had to offer sacrifices for their sins. Paul says that after Jesus' death and resurrection, there's a new, there's now a new way of righteousness that doesn't include our ability to keep the law. God had to reveal himself and his plan for salvation to everyone through Jesus Christ. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So for anyone to obtain God's righteousness, it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with how good we live or how well anyone keeps the law. This is where a lot of sinners that are lost get it wrong. They may say, hey, I'm doing the best I can. Salvation has nothing to do with our ability. Paul says it's by faith in Jesus Christ. A sinner, they must put their trust in Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. You know, we, we're to believe, which is meaning putting our faith in Jesus. Paul in this verse says, there is no difference. Through God's eyes, there is no difference in people. Doesn't matter what color our skin is or where you're even from. What country you're from, it doesn't matter. God offers salvation to all that believe. In verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a whole lot you can add 
to this verse makes it it makes it very clear we all come short of the glory of God sin has separated us from God in verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus you know through Jesus we that, uh, we that believe and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're justified. God says we're righteous in a legal sense. God exchanges our sins for the perfect, or for Christ's perfect righteousness. In Christ, one becomes all that God requires. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made righteous of God in him. And Paul says through uh, salvation through Jesus, hey, it's free. A free gift from God. And we that receive the free gift because of God's grace. You know, no one, no one can never, ever earn salvation no matter how hard they try. It's impossible. You know, Paul so mentions redemption. Every person is enslaved to sin before they're saved. Redemption is, is freeing a slave by paying a price. Jesus, he paid our price on the cross. Paid our sin debt by shedding his blood for our sins. God revealed himself to the world. Jesus just shows us, I mean, this just shows us how much God loves us. God deserves our praise every day. In verse 25, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Paul says that God's wrath for our sins has been forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross. The only way a person receives salvation is through Jesus, through our faith in Jesus. Propiti pro <laughs> I'm trying to hurry and I can't say it. Propitiation, yeah, something like that, has achieved, was achieved through the blood of Christ, which means the wrath of God has been turned away from, our, from us for our sins. So Paul makes it clear, again, the only way for forgiveness of our sins is through Jesus. In Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, that he might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In verse 26, to declare, I say at, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The law has no righteousness. It only serves to reveal a person's sin. But God, he is just. He has given us a gift of salvation through Jesus because Jesus is the justifier. Jesus was fully God. He is fully man. And he lived a perfect life without sin. That's what made him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So salvation, it's offered to everyone, but only to those that receive salvation through faith in Jesus. You know, think about how can anyone think that they can achieve salvation any other way? It's foolish. God's word makes it very clear right here in what we've read today. Jesus is the only way.